man, oh man. Uh, welcome to everybody here. Welcome to everybody watching us online. Good to have you with us as well. I'm excited. We are in part two of this brand new teaching series here that we started just last week at Cornerstone called Silent Symphony. Silent Symphony. And the subtitle is When God Goes Quiet. When God Goes Quiet. Basically what we're talking about the idea, the, the, the question that we're trying to answer in this series is the question, why does God seem so quiet? Why does God seem so quiet? Can anybody relate to that? At any point in your life, has God seemed quiet to you? Yes, absolutely. All of us can say that because at some point, God has always seemed quiet to someone, right? At some point. Um, uh, uh, we have different points in our life where God, we see in Scripture, what was so loud with things like the splitting of the Red Sea, right? That's a loud thing. That's a big thing. God was so loud with raining fire down from heaven, all these big acts. And we see that in Scripture, and then we see our life, and we're like, well, where's my Red Sea moment? <laughs> Right, like where, where, where is the splitting of the Red Sea for me? It, it seems pretty quiet in comparison. So what do we do when God seems to go silent? What do we do when God seems to be quiet in our life? And what we've been doing is studying the book of Esther. The book of Esther, it's one of only two books, get this, one of only two books in all of Scripture where God's name is never mentioned. It's kind of crazy. Not only is God's name never mentioned, he's never alluded to. Like they don't even really uh, uh, point to him and say, well, this was God and this is, they, there's no miracles even recorded in the book of Esther. It's a, a pretty crazy book and it's one that you may relate to because you feel like that's more relatable than the Red Sea moments of scripture, right? That, that God seems quiet and he seems distant and you're not sure if he's there or if he's working. So we've been studying this book. We started last week uh, in chapter three. I just wanna give a real short, as short as I can recap of where we're at in the story so no one's coming into it uh, uh, not knowing what's going on. So here, here's where we pick up in the book of Esther. God's chosen people, the Jewish nation, they have been uh, uh, overthrown by the Babylonian Empire, and then the Persian Empire came in and took over the Babylonian Empire. So right now, the Jewish people, they are living in exile in the Persian Empire. They're under the, the thumb of this pagan uh, empire and emperor, King Xerxes. And so they're living under this uh, uh, pagan rule. And during this time, this king, King Xerxes, is looking for a new queen. And he happens to hold his own Miss Persia contest. And a Jewish woman, he doesn't know that she's Jewish, but a Jewish woman by the name of Esther wins. She wins the king's favor. And so she becomes the next queen. Now, at this point, if you're a Jewish person and you know Esther is Jewish, you're like, we got an inside woman, all right? Like, we got, we got somebody in the halls of power. This is a good thing because it's been setback after setback after setback, right? Like, our, our kingdom was overthrown. We're living in exile now. So, hey, we've got somebody on the inside. This is, this is a good thing. But it gets better because, see, Esther's cousin a man by the name of Mordecai, who's kind of like a father figure to her. She, she's lost both of her parents. So her cousin Mordecai, he uncovers a plot to kill the king. There's a plot to kill Xerxes. He hears about it. He notifies Esther, and Esther alerts the king, giving credit to Mordecai. The assassination attempt is foiled. The king is saved. And now if you're a Jew, you're going, whoa, we're sitting pretty. Like, this is great. The queen is a Jewish person, and the guy who just foiled this assassination attempt is a Jewish person. Things are on the upswing. God must be moving. God's, God's talking. He's speaking. He's doing things. But then, unfortunately, not too long after that assassination attempt is foiled, things change. An evil man by the name of Haman comes into power. Uh, uh, he wins a lot of influence with King Xerxes, the king of the Persian Empire, uh, and the king actually issues an edict that, hey, everyone, whenever you see Haman walking by, whenever you see him, pay him honor by kneeling to him. Mordecai knows what an evil man this is. He follows God. He's not going to do it. He's not going to bow his knee. That infuriates Haman. Infuriates him. Infuriates him so much that rather than just killing Mordecai, he wants Mordecai's entire people wiped off the face of the earth. He's like, you know what, I'm, I'm so fed up with you, I'm so infuriated that you won't pay me the honor I feel like I'm due. I'm not 
happy to just have you executed. I'm going to have everybody who, who belongs to your race executed. And so he uses the influence that he has with King Xerxes, goes before him, tells him, hey, there's this people that live among your provinces. They don't listen to you. They don't listen to you. You told people to bow down before me. People aren't doing it. You need to wipe them out. You need to set, set the standard here so they know and the rest of your people know that you won't tolerate disobedience. And so the king agrees. They issue the, this edict. It's sent out to all the provinces saying, come, come this day, all Jewish people will be executed. They're going to the gallows. And that's where we left off last week. A pretty dire situation. A, a situation where you're looking at it and you're going, um, this ain't good. <laughs> like God's suddenly getting pretty quiet again, right? Like your, your people, the people that you said were going to be a blessed people and the whole earth was going to be blessed through them, they're about to be executed. And that's where we pick up today. So if you want to follow along, you got a Bible app or a hard copy Bible. We're in Esther chapter four, starting in verse one. So here's what happened. After that edict is sent out that all the Jewish people are to be killed. When Mordecai, again, Easter's cousin, or Esther's cousin, learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city wailing loudly and bitterly. But he only went as far as the king's gate because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province which the edict and the order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. That's something that the Jewish people would wear in times of mourning. Verse 4, when Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, told her, hey, your cousin is like not in a good place. When they came and told her this, she was in great distress. So she sent clothes for him to go put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. So Esther's like, okay, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find out what's going on here. My cousin is in great distress. I don't know what's going on. So she sends her attendant to go find out what is going on. Hathak, her attendant, went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay in the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in the city, Susa, to show to Esther and explain it to her. And he told, her, or told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence and beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. So basically what's going on here, Mordecai talks to Esther's attendant and is like, look, this is what's going on. I know Esther is not aware. The king has just issued a proclamation to have all of us killed. Like, we're all going to be wiped out. You have got to tell Esther. She's got to go back in. She's got to talk to the king, use whatever influence she has to try to persuade him and change his mind. Something different has to happen here. So Esther's attendant, Hathak, he went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say back to Mordecai, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. And it's been 30 days since I've been called to see the king. So Hester's like, look, I, I hear what you're saying. I get it. Things are bad. Things are, like, are, are terrible for our people. But you need to know something. I think I'm on the outs with the king. <laughs> like, if I go before the king and I have not been summoned, I will be put to death. That's what the law says. I'll be put to death. And he has not called on me in 30 days. I can't. I, I can't just walk in there. I can't go in his presence. Verse 12, when Esther's words were reported back to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you're in the king's house, you alone out of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And then here's the key, the key verse that it ends on. And who knows, Esther, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. So Mordecai is saying, look, if, if you think you'll be able to save yourself by not speaking up and just remaining quiet, God's going to bring up deliverance somewhere else. But Esther, what if you're here because you're supposed to be the conduit of God's deliverance? What if that's why you're in this Position. What if you were here for such a time as this? And what I want to say to everybody else is the words of Mordecai are leaping off the page of Scripture, and they're applying to every single person in here, everybody watching us on Facebook and YouTube. What if you're here today for such a time as this? Like, like what if you thought 
you know, you haven't been to church in a while, you want to get back in God's good graces, so you'll come today. Someone bribed you with like lunch afterwards, so you're like, yeah, sure, I'll come, right? Um, maybe you just clicked on here because someone shared this on YouTube or on Facebook until you're watching now, and you thought this was just a coincidence. You thought this was just you signing in. You don't realize this was a divine appointment, that God had this in mind for you for some time now, and, and you're here for a reason, right? You're here for a reason. God is wanting to speak to you. He is wanting to talk to you. So I want to say this. If you are someone in your life who, who you feel like you're in the midst of silence right now, like silent symphony, that kind of resonates with you. You're like, yeah, my, my life feels pretty quiet. God feels pretty quiet right now. Or if maybe you're in a good period in your life, but you see hundreds of people getting killed across the ocean in Afghanistan, and you're seeing that just horrific situation. There's no other word for it. You see what's going on over there, it'll bring you to tears. It's just, it's so sad. It's a humanitarian crisis, and, and we've got to pray. <laughs> we've got to pray for the people over there. Um, we've got to pray for our leaders. We've we just got to pray for the whole situation. It's terrible. And you look at that, and you go, God's awfully quiet in the middle of that. Like, I, I just saw a, a picture of a, a young 23-year-old Marine who was holding a baby, saying, I love my job. Three days later, she's dead in a suicide bombing. That's horrifying, where is God in that? Right now, there is a category four, almost category five hurricane hurtling towards Louisiana on almost the, I believe it's the 15th or 16th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. And it's right on its way. And those poor people, some of them are still rebuilding. They're still trying to get themselves out of what happened to them almost two decades ago. And you look at that and you're like, um, hello, like, <laughs> are, you, are you there? You're awfully quiet could use a Red Sea moment right about now, could use some fire falling from heaven right about now. Like, where, where are you, God? Why are you so quiet? And if that's where you're at, I wanna let you know today is for you and next week is for you. Please, please be back. Please be back. These teaching series that we do at Cornerstone, it's because we can't get up here. You, you all will leave. We can't get up here and speak for three straight hours. <laughs> we, just, we can't do it. You'll, you'll peace out. You'll just get out of here. So we got to split these things up, but I'm telling you right now, I'm telling you, these things build on each other. And so what we're talking about next week, you need to hear it if you are going through moments of silence in your life, because I promise you, even in the midst of that silence, there can be encouragement. There can, there can be encouragement and you can know that God, even though he may seem silent, he is not absent from your situation. And that's where we kind of let off last week. We talked about this idea that God is not absent just because he's silent, right? He's not absent just because he's silent. Um, in a symphony, the most important member of the symphony, the most important member of the orchestra doesn't make a noise. The conductor. The conductor makes zero noise, is silent the entire time, and yet the entire production falls on him or her, on them conducting things, on them knowing when people are supposed to come in and go out, and when this piece plays, and when that piece plays. The conductor is the only silent person, yet they are the most important person, and they navigate the entire orchestra. They navigate the entire symphony. Just because God is silent does not mean that he is absent. In fact, on the other hand, God may be quiet in your life because God's in control. He may be quiet because he's in control. If you've ever gotten into an argument with someone um, and you know you're on the right side, which is such a fantastic feeling, right? Whenever you're in an argument, and you're, you're able to know like, okay, I know that I'm doing things right. I know I'm, I'm honoring God here. It's a, it's a very peace-filled moment, even in the midst of high stress. But whenever you get into an argument with someone and things are getting kind of heated, and they start like losing it, like they're, they're yelling and they're getting more animated and stuff. It's very easy to tell who's really kind of on the, the right side and wrong side, right? Who's got control and who doesn't have control? Because the person who's loud and who's freaking out, blah, 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 that's the person who control has left the room for them. But it's the person who's even keel, who says, hey, look, I don't know what to tell you. This, this is how I see it, and this is what's happening. The person who is still, who is calm, who is steady, they have control. And in the same way, the enemy in your life tries to make a whole lot of noise, tries to seem bigger than he is because he actually doesn't have any power over your life. God, on the other hand, doesn't need to do that. He doesn't need to be loud. He doesn't need to be big. He doesn't be, need to be boisterous. He doesn't need any of that because he's actually in control. So he's calm. And he's quiet, 
And he's still because he can be, (laughs) because he's in control. He is the conductor. He's the conductor. And so with that in mind, and this is where we left off last week that we're picking up today, is with that in mind, what if the silence that you experience in your life is on purpose? What if the silence in your life is God actually setting you up for something? What if the silence is the setup? What if the silence is the buildup to something better happening in your life? And that's what we're going to be building on today. Um, What if silence is the setup? What if there's actually purpose in the pain that you're going through, right? What if there's purpose? Because that changes everything, doesn't it? If you know that the silence you're experiencing right now is just a setup for something better, you can handle it, can't you? Like like here at Cornerstone, um, please please hear me. I, I love our building. And it also needs, needs a facelift. <laughs> and it needs a few more thousand square feet, right? Like this is a small building. We bought this only because of COVID, because we knew we could fit in it now. But we have to add on. We have to renovate. All of those things have to happen. And since we know we're in the middle of a building campaign to make that happen, guess what that does for our current situation? It makes it sustainable, we're able to be in this. We're able to be in this period of, oh, man, it's, we really would like to have different paint. We'd like different light fixtures, and we'd like things here and there and there in the kids' area. We'd like it to look different. We would, we would love to do all that right now, but we're able to wait knowing something is coming. It makes the pain that we experience in the middle of this productive because it has a, it has a purpose. And the same is true if you have silence in your life where God feels quiet, but you know it's a setup for something better, you can handle it. It changes the entire way you view the silence that you are experiencing in your life. What if the silence is a setup? Because I'll tell you this much, God, God prefers to give the silent treatment sometimes. He just does. Can anyone relate to experiencing the silent treatment in their life, right? From a spouse, amen, hallelujah, I see those hands. That's my, <laughs> me and my wife are like polar opposites on how, how we like argue, how, how we talk on stuff. Um, I am a pusher. I'm like, if something's going down, I wanna talk, I wanna talk now, talk to me right now, what's going on, let's talk this out. Like, I, I hate it, I, I just wanna talk in that moment On the other hand, she's like, no, I want to decompress. I don't want to talk about it right now. (laughs) Let's talk about it later. I just want to collect my thoughts on stuff. And guess what's more effective? The silent treatment. (laughs) Like, every time, every time we do it her way, the conversation's better. Every time we do it her way, we actually both are able to, like, and sit and process and go over things well. Every time we do it my way, not so much, right? <laughs> like, it's just, it's not as effective. It doesn't work as well. The same is true with God. God uses a silent treatment a lot in your life because even though you may think you hate it, it's way more productive than you think it is. God does something in the midst of the silence, which is why he uses the silent treatment, which is hard. I just got to say it's hard for me to accept that because I don't like silence. I don't like it. Um, and, and this, this is one of the reasons I don't like it. Um, it's because silence can suck literally. <laughs> silence can literally suck the hope out of a situation. It just does. It just does. Silence, whenever it enters into a situation, it sucks hope out of it. You just feel like, God, are you, are you there? Like, are you, is everything okay? <laughs> Are you really talking to me? Did you really say this? Did you really say that? Silence can suck the hope out of a situation. That's exactly what happened, what we just read in the book of Esther. Esther chapter four, listen to verse three and four again. This is, this is the Jews' reaction to hearing about this proclamation going out. In every province which the edict came, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Esther even tried to send Mordecai different clothes, be like, hey, hey, cheer up, cheer up. He refused them, just completely and utterly refused them because silence had sucked the hope out of the situation. And that's what it does. And it's hard. It's hard when you go through silent periods and go through silent moments. And that's exactly what Mordecai was experiencing. It's like um, if you've ever had someone who you think has your back, like, you, you think, man, they're, they're here, they're good, they're on my side, you know, we're, we're, we're good, we're tight. And then you find out someone talked bad about you, and they were present for that and didn't say a word. 
Yeah, absolutely. Ouch. <laughs> right? That hurts. That hurts because you're like, man, you just sat in, in silence. I thought you had my back. I thought you were looking out for me. I got to imagine that's what Mordecai was feeling times 100. Like, God, I'm, I'm honoring you. Like, I'm, I'm not bowing my knee before a, a, an unrighteous person. Like, I'm not bowing my knee to them. I'm, I'm honoring you. And this is, this is how you repay me? You don't, you don't have my back. You're silent. You're silent in this moment. That's hard. Silence, when you experience it, it can make you question, did God really say that? Are things really going to be okay? Are things really going to turn out the way that I hoped they would? Because silence can suck hope out of a situation, but it doesn't have to. Silence can change you and make you more bitter, but it doesn't have to. Silence can cause doubt in your life, but it doesn't have to. Silence can instill fear in your heart, but it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to do any of those things. It can suck hope out, but it doesn't have to. And we actually see that happen with Mordecai. We see that happen with him. Even though it seems like hope was completely sucked out of this situation, Mordecai stays the course. Listen again. This is verse 1. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. Now, for a lot of us, we hear that and we're like, wait, what? What? He stayed the course? Like, it sounds like he's having a breakdown right now. <laughs> like, he, he's going out in the city, he's wailing, he's all this different stuff. What is going on here? Why, why is what we're seeing from Mordecai a signal that, like, this is, this is something we should do? Because in the midst of Mordecai's silence, guess what he didn't do? He didn't turn back. Do you guys remember why this proclamation to kill all of the Jewish people even got issued in the first place? Because Mordecai wouldn't bow his knee to this evil man, Haman. That's the whole reason. This, this text could have said, when Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he left and entered into the presence to, to say, hey, I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, Haman, I'm sorry. I'll, here we go. Is that better? Are we good now? Can we, can we like undo that, that, that proclamation now? He didn't do that. He didn't turn his back. He, he didn't go back on what he did. He kept the course. He kept going with what he knew he was supposed to do. And here's the thing that Mordecai understood that we have got to understand in our own life. If you honor the Lord, you can trust the silence. If you honor God, if you are truly honoring God with your life, it's like Pastor Charles Stanley says, if you obey God, you can just leave the outcome to him. You don't even have to worry. You just leave the outcome to him because if you are totally obeying God, he, he's on the hook. You're not anymore. That's the kind of life I want to be able to say, there you go. You're, it, it's on you now, not me, because I don't want things to be on me. <laughs> like, I'm not that good. I'm, I'm, I'm not that good of a person. I'm not that good at making things happen. I, I want God on the hook for my life, not myself, not my own talent, not my own strength. I don't want that. And if you obey God, if you honor the Lord, if moments of silence come in your life, you can still trust, even in the midst of it. Even in the midst of the silence, you can trust God, just like Mordecai. He wept. It was still hard. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that the silence you go through isn't difficult. Like if you're going through a silent period in your life right now where God seems quiet and God seems distant, it doesn't make it any easier to know that he's still there and, and suddenly you're like, well, okay, now I'm not, now I'm not sad anymore. Now I'm not, now I'm not um, uh, missing this connection with God anymore. No, you're still going to feel that. Mordecai still wept. Mordecai still wailed. But man, whenever you know that God is still present, it can do something for you. It can give you a little bit of confidence to know that the silence you may be experiencing is just the setup for something better. Cornerstone, we, we are there, aren't we? we? We've been in periods of silence as a church. We've been in periods of silence, and we know, man, the good part's coming. Like, the good part's coming. We're in the good part now, and it's continuing to come because God, man, it's just a setup for something better. And the reason we can say that, not with just blind hope, but with confidence is because we're trusting in the Lord. I, I, can, tell you, I can tell you without um, uh, hesitation that leadership of our church is doing everything we can to honor God, everything we can to honor God. With our finances, uh, with the way we live our life, we are doing everything we can to honor God. And so I can say if there's any moments that it seems like God's being quiet, I'm not getting freaked out. I'm just not. So I'm like, yeah, the good part's coming. The good, the good part's coming. The silence is a setup 
for what God is about to do. Mordecai knew that. It's why he was able to stay the course. He was able to know I can obey God and leave the outcome to him. I can honor the Lord and I can trust the silence. I can trust in the silence. God uses silence. He uses silence in our life. And it's, it's, it's funny because it can feel like the silence that we go through is such a unique experience. Like it can feel like when God seems distant, it can feel like you're the only one there, right? Like today, we're singing Spirit lead me, and everyone's got their hands up, and we're all like, oh, it's so, it's so emotional, right? And, and you can feel like you're the only one who's not really there because it doesn't feel like the Spirit's leading you. And it doesn't feel like he's close. And you're like, step out on the water. Yeah, right. Like, I, I'm, no, no, because it, it feels like you're, you're distant, and God feels quiet, and it can feel so unique because you look around the room, and everybody seems to be so much farther ahead of you. Which, by the way, can I just say something real, real quick? Um, there's not a perfect person in this church. Like, the, um, <laughs> this is, this is one, one tagline that churches sometimes use, and I think it's funny because it's, it, I mean, I get what they're trying to say, but it's not really true whenever they're like, no perfect people allowed. Well, good, because they don't exist. <laughs> right? Of course they're not allowed, because there is no such thing as a perfect person, right? We're, we are all in process. We're all in process. So whenever you look around the room and you feel that, and it feels like, man, it's such a unique experience that I feel like God's distant from me, it's not unique. God just uses silence sometimes. In what feels like, man, God's picking on me, and he's not talking to me, and this must be something about me, man, God just goes quiet sometimes. He uses silence. So whenever you find yourself in the middle of silent moments, just look around, <laughs> ask around, share how you're feeling because I promise you, you will be shocked at who is sharing silence with you. You'll be shocked because it may be people who you're looking around and you're going, man, they look great. Everything looks awesome. They've got a, they've got a great family situation. They, they have a loving marriage. They've got good finances. Everything's great. And you have no idea they're going through the same crap you are. God seems quiet. God seems distant. And you have no idea. You want to know how I know that? Because Mordecai talks to Esther and says, hey, queen, living up there in your beautiful palace with your people who come in and do your makeup and get you all ready for the day. And they give you the choice food for the day. Hey, can, can you take a second to remember your people? Because we're about to be killed out here. Don't know if you know that. God seems distant. We need someone to come through for us. And guess what Esther's response is? I know you may think that you're going through silence alone, Mordecai. I haven't been called on the king in going on a month. I know things look great from your perspective. From outside the palace, things look like, man, I'm, I'm living the life. But I want to let you know, I might be on the chopping block. I may have lost favor with the king. And by the way, you remember what happened with the last person who lost favor with the king, queen, or with the king? They're gone. <laughs> That's why I'm even here. Because he kicked the old one out and found a new one. And so you may think that you're the only one going through this, this silent period with God. But let me tell you, I'm going through it too. You will be shocked. You will be shocked to see the people around you that are going through silence too. You will be absolutely blown away who's sharing in it, who is everything looks fine, everything looks great, but they're going through a period where God seems quiet as well. And what that is supposed to do for us is exactly what we see happen with Mordecai and Esther. They realize we're both going through the same kind of thing, and so they draw closer to each other. They're talking to each other. That's exactly what God intended for us. You are not supposed to navigate the silence alone. None of us are. We're not supposed to navigate it alone. If you're not a part of a C group yet, like if you haven't signed up for one of our C groups here at Cornerstone, our small groups, do it today. You can do it out in the lobby. You can go online, cornerstonechurch.info. You can sign up for a C group. Get your butt in community. Like, I can't, I can't say it any stronger without having people question my, my ability to be a pastor anymore, right? But, but get your butt in one of these groups because I'm telling you, you will get into these groups and you'll start to realize, oh, you too? 
Oh, you too? I thought everybody in here had their stuff together. What, what a refreshing thing to realize I'm not the only one who struggles with that. What a refreshing thing to realize like you're going through that too. Man, we have, we have groups for just about everything. If you're struggling with anxiety, we have, we have a group for that. <laughs> if you're uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, we have um, uh, Al-Anon. We have a group on setting up boundaries in your life. I, I'm starting a group for guys to just get together here at the church and watch Monday Night Football on Mondays. Like, We literally have a group for everything. (laughs) And you want to know why we do that? Because once you get in community with each other, you start to realize things about each other. You start to have those, oh, you too, moments. And you start to realize, hey, okay, I'm not as alone as I thought I was on this stuff. Maybe I'm not the only one who's experiencing silence right now from God. And you know what the cool thing is? Not only do you experience and you get to talk to people who are going the same thing you are, There'll be people in your group who are on the other side of it. Be like, man, I was exactly where you are a few months ago, wondering why God was so quiet, wondering why I wasn't seeing any changes. And let me tell you, he came through for me in such a huge way. He came through for me, and I promise you, you keep honoring him. You can trust him in the silence because I am a testimony of what happens when you do that. I've made it through the other side, and I'm telling you, you only hear part of that. You only know part of that if you just come on Sundays and just listen to me you miss a whole entire other section of that stuff of people who God has shown up for them and delivered them and they can speak to you. God can speak to you through them, through their experiences, through what they have been through. So I am telling you, get signed up for a C group if you haven't yet because God speaks through a variety of ways. God uses all of his creation to speak. In fact, I I would say this, um, God isn't really quiet. He just likes to give credit. He's not quiet. He just spreads it around. Like you thought God was quiet in your life, but he's been talking through your sister. (laughs) You thought God was quiet in your life, but all of those Facebook posts that pop up on your feed that seem so timely, it's crazy. You think that's a coincidence? That's God. God. All of these things in your life, you were expecting a a Red Sea moment. You were expecting the sea to part. You were expecting fire to fall. And God's saying, hey, I'm talking to you. It may not look like what you expected, but I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you through all these different avenues. I'm not quiet. I just like to include other people. I'm not quiet. I just like to share the credit. I like to spread it around a little bit and get people included in what I'm doing. You know how we know that's true? Because we have this. It's, the, the, the Christian doctrine, what we believe about the Bible, is that the Bible is God's inspired word that he used to communicate to us through fallen man. Like, God could have, if, if we believe what we say we believe, he could have snapped his fingers and a completed Bible could have fallen from the sky down to us, and we could have had it that way. And he could have just avoided any fallen man and our fingerprints on anything. He could have done that, but he didn't want to do that. He wanted to partner with us. He wanted to spread the credit around. He wanted to include us in what he is doing. And the same thing is true right now. God is not quiet. He just likes to give credit. God likes to include people in what he is doing. And we see that again, Esther 4.14. Listen to what Mordecai says to her. And who knows Esther? but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. He's saying, hey, look, you're probably here because of God. Like the whole reason you're, you're here is because God is not just wanting to have this big Red Sea moment where he just blows in the door and he just has his way. No, God is wanting to bring deliverance and he's wanting to bring it through you. He's wanting to include you. He's not silent, (laughs) He's wanting to act, and he's wanting to act through you and through your life. Perhaps you are here for that exact moment. Perhaps you are here so he can work through you. God works through people. He takes our obedience, and he uses that, and he works in silence using our obedience so much of the time. So much of the time, God's hands and God's feet are simply his people being obedient. So that means in your life, you may be looking for a Red Sea moment. You may be looking for fire to fall from the sky, but instead what you'll get is, is your sister talking to you or a Facebook post or something on TV or something that you experience while you're out walking, uh, 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 you know, on a, a jog or something like that. And God will speak to you through all these different ways because that's how he works. It's always how he's worked. 
He's worked that way since the beginning. It's why we have the Bible that we have because he wants to include people. He wants to include people. And man, I got to tell you, I have been experiencing this in such a huge way. Um, I I'm, 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 won't get into it, um, but I'm going through some stuff right now. Like I'm, I'm going through some stuff, um, and, I, and I've had the moments where I'm feeling like, man, I, like, God, are you there? Is this, is this right? Like, am I, are we doing what we should do? And are, are we doing what we should do? Because um, it just feels kind of quiet. And, and is that you, God? And is that you? And it's amazing how if, if I was just waiting for Red Sea moments and these gigantic, big, loud things that God is doing, how I would miss it. And I probably would think that, man, God's just quiet. He's not here. Where is he? God, where are you? Like, if that's all that I was looking for. But it is crazy how through all these little outlets, through what people have said, not knowing anything, from what I've seen on, uh, uh, on social media, from what people have talked about, from, from things, I, I can't even tell you how much this sermon series is speaking to me, like how much I'm learning from it as I'm studying um, each week, it, and it's crazy. This sermon series was set up over six months ago, when what I'm going through right now, I had no idea I'd be dealing with it now. And I kid you not, you can, you can look at, you could open up my iPad and look at the date created on this sermon series and see this thing was set six months ago. And what I'm going through right now, it literally could not be more timely. It couldn't be more pertinent. And I see things like that and I'm like, that is my Red Sea moment. <laughs> like God doesn't need to yell. He is confirming for me time and time and time again, even in what seems like the silence, he's just using a different way. It's not silence. It's God. It's God. And we know that because silence is not absence, right? Just because God is, is, is silent, it seems, that does not mean that he's absence because God uses everything. God uses everything. Everything, even things, Genesis tells us, even things that the enemy means for evil, God uses for good. So everything in all of creation, you heard us talking about that earlier in the service, everything in creation, including silence, can be used by God to communicate. That's the, that's the mystery and the wonder of God, that our God is so incredible that even silence is a communication method for him. Even silence, not saying a word, he's able to transform us and bring about the change that we need to have in our life. God uses everything, just like a symphony. There's not just one instrument in an orchestra. There is a whole whole suite of uh, 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 French horns and bass and oboe. There's all of these different instruments playing. And in the same way, God uses everything in his creation, everything in the symphony to speak. He uses it. He uses it. He likes to spread the credit around. And so Mordecai, Esther, the, the, the Jewish people who, who they were in the midst of this exile, they're in the midst of this pagan rule under this uh, uh, King Xerxes, having this edict put on their head saying, hey, on this day, it's going to be the end for you. You're going to be executed. In the middle of all that and feeling like there was silence from God, still in the middle of all that, they were able to have hope and they were able to to have confidence. I mean, listen again, Mordecai even said, if you don't act, Esther, the deliverance from the Jews will arise from another place. Mordecai is just believing it. He's like, I, I know this will not end in the eradication of our people because God made us a promise and he's gonna see it through. So I, I know it's not gonna end that way. You can have confidence even in the midst of your silence. And that's because God doesn't just speak to us on mountaintop moments, does he? He speaks to us in the valley. He speaks to us whenever everything seems dark and quiet and it feels like we're alone. God speaks to us even then. And so that means just like these Jewish people who were in exile, we can have encouragement even when we're in exile. We can be encouraged and know, you know what? We're not going through this alone. We're not going through this alone. Can I tell you some of Cornerstone, Pastor Brenda would attest to this. Cornerstone, we've been around for 40 plus years now, 40 plus years, and some of our best years as a church have been from 2017 on. Isn't that right, Pastor Brenda? From all of the, the, the meaningful metrics, not just attendance, but the meaningful metrics, people giving their life to Jesus, people becoming ministry partners, people trusting God with their finances, all of those numbers 
have never been higher. They've never been higher. And for some of you who don't know, because we have so many new faces, um, 2017, the reason that year matters is because that's the year that we lost our old building, that we left our denomination. The denomination kept it. And so we were a people in exile. <laughs> we were people in a foreign and strange land called Coventry Elementary School, right? Like we were, we were <laughs> setting that bad boy up and tearing it down every week. And that was a nightmare. That was a nightmare doing that over and over and over again. But in the midst of that exile, in the midst of that silence, where it can feel like, well, man, look, I mean, they lost their building and who, wow, it just doesn't look good. We had some of the most encouraging days we've ever had as a church, right? And it's, and it's because the silence is a setup. Because we know from step one, we've been doing everything in our power to honor God and so in the midst of the silence, we say, hey, we trust him because <laughs> the good part's coming. We trust him because the good part's coming. The silence is just a setup for what God is doing. So even in exile, we can be encouraged. This, this is what I want us to close on today. Um, I'm going to skip ahead uh, a few books of scripture. So we're going to jump from Esther to the book of Isaiah. You don't have to turn there or anything. Uh, but I just want to read these verses real quick. This is Isaiah 55, the prophet Isaiah, a man that God rose up to communicate on his behalf. Isaiah wrote this particular set of verses that we're about to read. He wrote them not too long after the Jewish nation fell to the Babylonian empire. So this is right after this nation that God had started and had instituted and said he was going to change the whole world to this nation. That nation had just collapsed, had just collapsed. And this is what Isaiah writes on God, speaking for God. This is what he says. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. My faithful love promised to David, David being King David, the, uh, one of the greatest leaders in Israel's history. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a ruler and a commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you don't know, and nations you do not know will come running to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. That's what God is saying to the Jewish nation. He's saying this to Israel, and he's saying it just a couple of years after they fell, the temple was destroyed, and they're being carted off to a pagan land. And yet in the middle of it, God is saying, hey, I don't... I don't forget things. I remember what I promised my servant David, and I will see it come to fruition. I'm going to bless the entire world through you. People will know that you are my people because I will bless the whole world through you. And if you're a Jewish person reading this at that time, you've got to be thinking, how in the world is that true? <laughs> We've just lost all of our power, all of our prestige. You seem to be pretty quiet right now, God. How in the world are you going to bring that about when everything seems so silent right now? And just a few verses down, this is what God says, and this is the key to it. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. You see, God's method for handling things isn't necessarily ours. It's just not. I've already told you, I've already admitted, I hate silence. Jessica, my, my wife can tell you, I still push. <laughs> I still want to talk because I don't like the silent treatment. I, I want to not talk about it. I want to talk about it right now. That is still me. I hate silence. And so if I had my way, I would never have a silent period. If I had my way, there, there would never be moments of silence in my life where God seems to go quiet. But you know what? God knows I need it. God knows I need it. Something happens to me. We talked about it last week, right? Avengers Endgame. If you've seen the, the movie, the scene where the portals start opening up, everything seems like the, the bad guys are going to win and Captain America is about to get killed. And it's like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. It's, it's so bad. And the music all gets real low. But then it starts to build back up. And the whole reason, the whole reason it gets you amped and you want to go fight Thanos too, the whole reason that happens is because of the dynamics, because the thing builds, because there was quiet, because things seem bad. 
It does something. The dynamics, it, it, it builds something in you and it makes that part resonate. Like I told you, man, the people in my theater, they were ready to charge the screen when I saw it one of the nights in the theater. Man, because it, it gets you so amped. And the same thing is true in our life. During those silent periods, God does something to us that couldn't happen if it didn't get quiet. It couldn't happen if it, we didn't go through a few silent periods. God knows we need it. You don't want silence. God knows you need silence. You don't want it. You want every day to be a mountaintop moment with God. Every day to be, oh, I'm trusting you, Lord, and everything's great, and everything's wonderful. That doesn't happen. It doesn't. And I'll let you know, it doesn't happen for the people up here on stage either. It doesn't happen for me. It, it's just not that way. But even in the moments where there's silence, even in the moments where you feel confused and you feel like, man, even in those moments, you can have an underlying confidence that knows, you know what, the good part is going to come. The good part is going to come. This silence is just a setup for what God is doing. Here, here's the, the, the closing idea for today. Um, when we do think that God is silent in our lives, what if, what if his silence is actually his presence showing up in a way we weren't expecting? Right? We kind of hit on this idea a little bit earlier, but what if God's silence that we think we're experiencing, it's not. He, he's just showing himself in a way that we weren't looking for, right? Like if I'm just looking for those big mountaintop moments, I'm going to miss it. I'm going to miss it. I, I got to tell you, like this, like this sermon series we're talking about, I, I did a seminar yesterday here at Cornerstone. We had a, a, a Mending Mindsets. It's like a mental health seminar. And uh, the, the subject that I spoke on yesterday same thing as this series. I'm, I'm not kidding you guys. I can't tell you how weird this is, how crazy it is. This is something um, Debbie Ring sent me an email. Uh, uh, one of the ladies on our staff sent me an email asking me to speak, asking me to speak on the subject I spoke on yesterday. Back in like April, like late April, and it, what she talked about is exactly what I'm going through right now. The thing that I had to study for, the thing that I had to prep for, it's exactly what I'm going through. I'm like, this is crazy. Like, this is this is not coincidence. This is not coincidence. God is conducting. It's not coincidence. God is conducting something. And it may, me and Pastor Brenner were just talking about this in, in between services. Um, whenever the conductor starts to conduct, what's he have to do? Turn his back to the crowd, <laughs> right? Turn his back to the crowd. Kudos to Pastor Brenda for that. Um, he, he turns his back to the crowd. And for a lot of us, it may seem like God's turning his back on us. And wow, it's so quiet right now. It's so quiet and God's turning his back on us. He's just conducting. He's getting ready to do something in your life. He's getting ready to conduct and you have no idea what he's about to do in your life. So in the middle of the silence, don't lose heart. Stay encouraged. Keep encouraged because he is there. He is there. You just got to start looking for him. You just got to start looking for him and know that if you are doing everything you can to honor God, you can trust him whatever silence comes your way. I'm going to pray for you, all right? Heavenly Father, uh, man, 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 do I need this sermon today. Uh, thank you so much for your faithfulness, God. Um, you, you know what we need before we even know it. And it may look like you're being quiet. It may look like you're not there, but my goodness, God, are you there? We know that you are always present. Nothing takes you off guard in, uh, uh, in our life. Um, you know everything that's coming our way. Everything that comes our way is filtered through your hands first. And so, God, in the moments whenever we feel like we've been surprised or we've been taken off guard and you seem to be quiet, help us to remember that you are a conductor and that you are working in our life. And as long as we are obeying you, we can trust the outcome to you. As long as we are following you and honoring you, we can trust you in the silence, knowing that you will make all things work together for our good. So God, help us to keep up our end of the bargain. None of us want to be on the hook for our life. None of us want to be on the hook. We don't want our willpower and our strength and our wisdom to be the thing that gets us by in life. God, we're relying on you. We are relying on you. So in these silent moments, help us to remember that you are there, that we can put our faith and trust in you, and that you will see us through. We love you so much, Father, and we pray all this in your name. Amen.